Ah, this meeting is being live streamed. There we go. Brilliant. So Just waiting to see. Sorry, Asta, are you going to try and send a slide through s some means, or should we start without it? I always forget what the housekeeping stuff is. <laughs> I think we should start. Just yeah. go through. You know, um, you just let them know that the the session is being recorded. Uh, that will send out the recording and yeah. that they should please remain muted unless they're speaking. Yep. Um, and then paste, maybe paste uh, Asta's email address in the chat in case they have any problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I uh, think I am able to join here. Can you okay. see my... Can you see it? Okay. I can see, I can't see anything, but I can see that there's another in Asp in the room. Oh, I think that's me. Yeah, okay. The one that's talking now. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. I can share the slide. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to Hello. Hi. There you are. Uh, it, hi, sorry. Uh, okay. It okay. Is... okay. So can we let people in? It's five minutes past. Oh, okay. There are a lot of people. Yes. Um, are you happy to 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 do the usual introductions, Asta? Uh yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll um I'll hand over to you then. Um, I guess let's let everybody in. Okay, I think we can let them in and then I can share the slides. Okay, brilliant. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tea Time with Authorate. Uh, let's wait for two minutes as many of us are joining in and we are really, really thankful to everyone for registering and for being here. Um, we got overwhelming responses of almost 1,000 people registering for this uh, particular masterclass, which must be our all-time highest uh, ever since. Yeah, thank you so much for registering and making the time out for joining today. Uh, let's take a minute or two. Yeah, we already had the host of uh, the facilitator of today's event, Edmund, with us. He's right there. Yeah. Um, so Authorate also is a platform where you can network and um, get to know each other, explore the collaboration opportunities. So while we... Uh, are here. Don't forget to introduce yourself, where you are from, what you are doing right now, and uh, uh, and maybe uh, we can get started. Let me share my screen with everybody. Uh, okay. Uh, is my screen 
vegetable? Yes. Uh, yes. So, we are today discussing designing an effective publication strategy. And today is February 28th, Wednesday, and it is midweek. And I'm very, very inspired by everybody's commitment to the program. Um, so, we have Edmond with us. Uh, I would like to briefly introduce him. Um, so, uh, Edmond is the Assistant Professor in Environmental Forensic at the Northern Mumbai University. He was previously an Associate Professor at the Institute of Marine Science at uh, Santo University. His research focuses on understanding the impact of organic pollutants in aquatic environments. Um, Edwin has been previous facilitator and host of uh, many of the authors program and um, you can watch the previous recordings from our YouTube also. Um, meanwhile, I would also like to share some of the ground rules of the program with you. Uh, so we do have a few housekeeping, which I believe are very much known to everybody. Uh, so we are recording the session and your participation here indicates uh, that you are giving the consent for the recording. And um, here we go. So yeah, we are recording the session. Yes, did you hear the recording in process, progress? And I believe that Zoom sent out automated uh, message to everybody asking for the consent and yeah that's that uh the closed caption captions are available you can click on the cc button um it is in the if you click the three dots it could be there uh three dots in the lower part of the screen in the menu bar and then you can find the captions and please use this function uh, if you have any technical issues, you can let us know via chat or email me at asha.subedi at inapps.info. Uh, so to reduce the background noises and make sure that the station is running smoothly, we would like to request everybody to mute except when they are speaking and make the uh, full utilization of the raise your hand feature. It is also in the menu bar. Uh, it is in the three dots and you can... Uh, use the hand gestures there. Uh, questions and comments are welcomed anytime in the chat box. Um, and at the end also, we do have some question and answer session. This is a very, very interactive space. So we would like to encourage everybody to make a full utilization of our breakout spaces and other discussions. And um, we really hope that you would have a very, you'll have a very lovely learning journey. I'm I'm pretty much sure that I will have one with Edmund today. And uh, with this, I'd like to hand to Edmund. And we do have other members from Authorade, Andy and Tabitha to support. So if you need us anytime for the technical support, we are here. Thank you and handing it over to Edmund. Hi, everyone. I hope you are ready for an exciting journey that we are going to have today. We want to design a publishing strategy. So today's workshop, like all other masterclasses, this is a hands-on activity. Most of the things for you to get the maximum benefit out of this, you need to take part in the activities that we are going to to, to have. So um, we are going to be using... On level C. level C. So you need to go up on the left to C level. Uh -huh. Hi, please uh, mute yourself when you are not uh, talking. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, so we are going to be using Mentimeter. So I'm going to share my screen right now. I want you to get Mentimeter, go to menti.com. I want you to go to menti.com. Then you enter Can you see now? Yes, we can see. Yes. yes. Can you enter go to menti.com and enter the code that you see? There is a code. 
at the top. Please go to that code and enter. You just get the number again for the code and say it out. Just press love if you have entered the code. Just say love, add the love. See two people have added the love. Just press a heart, just three people. We'll be using Menti today, so it's more interactive. So uh, the moment you enter the code and you have seen the first page, uh, just press the half, the love or like button so that I know that you have all signed up. There are about 136 people. So when we get to 70, then we'll move forward. Please sign up the moment you sign in, either press the like or press the love, then we proceed. Uh, I understand we all under know that coming up with an effective publication strategy is very important, particularly when you are planning your career, whether you are planning to pursue an industry career, a government-based career, an academic career, we need a good publication strategy because uh, publications, that's how we communicate our science, that's how we demonstrate our expertise, that's how we can convince other people that we are really good at what we are doing. So it's this, uh, from the uh, sign up, it, can, it shows that uh, people are really interested about this particular topic. It's something that is uh, really relevant to this hour. So I have about 34 people that have signed, that have logged in. Please enter the code that is on the top right. Uh, on, go to menti.com, then enter the code. Uh, can you please do that so that we can proceed? Because if you don't sign up, you might end up losing you along the way. Uh, all the activities that we are going to be doing today will be based on menti.com. So please uh, sign up. I'll just give 30 seconds, then we move on. Okay, we have about 45 people we have signed in. Uh, please do so quickly if you haven't signed in. Okay, now I want us just to know where you are. Just drop a pin where you are right now. Just drop a pin so that we know where you are. Just, you can just drop the pin. Right. I noticed there's someone in Brazil, Tanzania, uh, that's supposed to be Botswana, or, uh, Nepal, uh, South Africa, three people, Tanzania, Kenya, three people, Ethiopia, uh, Namibia, India. Uh, there is someone from Iceland that's interesting. <laughs> Uh, more people from Southeast Asia, more people in Tanzania. Uh, Dr. Bomi, that's you are in Philippines. Uh, more again, Tanzania and Nigeria of three people. Uh, Congo, that's Congo Brazzaville, two people as well. So uh, we can see that we are all spread out, only two people from. Uh, Europe and the majority of people are coming from Tanzania, followed by Kenya. Uh, thank you for signing up. Thank you for joining. Uh, we really hope you are going to benefit a lot from what we are going to do today. So, first question. Uh, okay, so what is your career stage? Uh, what is your career stage? Uh, some are studying uh, MSc. Uh, more people are either lecturer or postdoc. Uh, I'm an established researcher. Uh, we don't have established researchers. Uh, something that we would expect. Uh, again, more are studying for a PhD. One established researcher. 
many more people are doing their MSc, which is, this is really lovely. I love this. Uh, as you can see, most of the of the participants, they are studying, right? Which means you have made the right decision to join this uh, workshop because it's going to prepare you for something that is really lovely. You are going to start thinking about your publishing strategy right now. A good publishing strategy should be long term. So if you are an MA master's student and thinking about this, this is excellent. Uh, congratulations for making that wonderful decision. Uh, so how, how many academic papers have you written? If you have written any academic papers, how many have you written? Uh, four people, have, six, seven, have written more than five. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, eight, nine people still climbing. We haven't written anything. That's that's okay. I think when you haven't written anything, that's the best place to start off. You have, when you have just three publications and you have, or you haven't written anything, that's the best place to start off because you need to have a strategy before you start. It's like going for a for uh, a trip, right? You don't plan where you are going when you have already started your journey. You need to start to plan about that journey before you start it. So thank you for joining before you have started uh, writing any papers or, you've, or even if you've just written three papers, that's wonderful. So this shows us that we have an audience that is really planning ahead, that is, that is really thinking deeply about having a strategy. Now, the next thing that we want to look at now is if you had a superpower related to academic publishing, what would it be and why? I want you to write your response. If you have a superpower, uh, which is related to academic writing, what would it be and why? Make it fun, make it exciting, make it interesting, be creative. I just want to see the responses that we're going to have here. Just keep it short. Also writing my superpower as well. Oh, quick literature review, undeniable proposal. Wow, I also need that superpower that when you, whenever you write your publication, your proposal is accepted. Manuscript formatting, wow. Critical thinking is uh, topping the charts here. Uh, quality papers, reading minds, I like that one, I like that one. Writing, that's excellent. Write a paper in one second, that's, 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 that's the superpower I need. If I could just write a paper, I wake up one moment, now I want to write a paper in one second, I'm done. Oh, that's excellent. Generate ideas, wonderful. Storytelling, that's wonderful. We, a good paper is a good story, right? So storytelling is uh, a good, really, superpower. Uh, quality research, that's wonderful. To, for you to have a good publication, your research should be of high quality. Visualization. I need that superpower. When whenever I look back at some of the of the visuals that I have prepared for my diagrams of all my publications, it's kind of disappointing. Uh, if I had this superpower, I know that I could write perfect graphical abstracts, perfect results and discussion figures. Everything will be perfect. This is amazing. So from this activity, we can see uh, our all, all our longings, right? Uh, we long to find a good journal. We long to write rapidly. We long to be critical when we are writing. We long to be able to remember uh, the articles that we have written. All those things are pertinent when you are writing a, an academic paper. But how do the, does all these things feed into coming up with a strategy? Because a strategy should reinforce your, your need for, for quality read papers. Your strategy should reinforce your need for critical thinking. Your strategy should reinforce your need to be writing uh, good problem statements. So how do you develop a strategy that embraces these superpowers? How do we do that? So if you have that question, 
today is a lovely day for you because we are going to be answering that question today. So now I, I want us to just do a uh, one minute exercise. Just write one word that des best describes your primary goal for academic publishing. Just one word that describes your goal. I'm going to enter my word as well. Can you, we all do the same. Promotion, career, career is stopping visibility. Uh, you need a strategy that kind of help you become more visible. Promotion is being uh, emphasized again and again. Uh, transfer new knowledge, that's wonderful. Uh, new knowledge again, people are emphasizing networking, uh, disseminating information, awards, uh, to receive awards, value, adding value to society or the your, your, your discipline, all those things. So you can see all these different aspects of publish, of uh, coming up of, uh, with an effective publishing strategy. They range from personal uh, goals that I want to improve in my career, I want to gain expertise, and I want to impact my research discipline, and I also want to impact society as a whole. So all these things, all these are uh, words that we are throwing in here demonstrate how, how varied or the range to, to which a good publishing strategy should encompass. It should not just focus on career, but it should also involve impact. It should also involve connecting with other researchers. So that is what we are going to be doing today, that we want to develop a publishing strategy that encompasses all these things because we want to grow wholesomely, not in a single area, but in a wholesome way, way that we are developing in research, in teaching, in um, societal impact, in engagement, in all these different aspects of being a researcher. So that's the goal of today's activity. That's the things that we want to address today. So now I'm going to give you 10 minutes. Uh, I hope uh, Esther uh, and all the other staff can help me. Uh, we want to create breakout rooms. We have about 200 people. Um, so maybe you need uh, at least maybe 10 people uh, per group. Now, this is the instruction. Please don't move away from your Mentimeter so that you remember these instructions. So when you go to the groups, I want you to close your eyes uh, for five minutes, grab a piece of paper, then you draw a map of your publishing journey. You can include symbols. Remember, your eyes are supposed to be closed when you are doing this. Symbols to represent achievement, strategies, um, uh, your targets, all the different aspects of it. Just create this map with your eyes closed. Do that for, 30, for one minute. Then after that, you discuss with your group members for eight minutes uh, about your map. You just share your map with your group members and tell them what it is about. So I want all us to do that in our group, in, in, in our breakout rooms. Uh, Edmund? Yes. When uh, after how many minutes should I close the rooms? Can you? After how many minutes should I close the rooms? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, no problem.
Okay, who's left? <laughs> um, someone in room 26 asked for help. 26. 26, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, Edwin's gone over to them, I think. Okay, so I guess it's if there's those anybody... of you those yeah. of you who have not joined breakout rooms, you should have had a notification on your screen. Um, please, can you press the button to join the breakout room if you're able to? Thank you. There we go. There we go. And for people that are, for people who who just join though, we'll have to manually put them in a room, won't we? That's what I'm doing. Oh, okay. Okay, you're on it. Uh, Nafisa, where should, oh. It's weird, it's not showing the people on the screen in the unassigned block in my view. No, they they have all been assigned, it's just that they uh, okay. in the okay. rooms. So Naf Nafisa, are you, are you saying that, oh, okay, you've, you can join, okay. <laughs> moving so quickly. 26 breakout rooms. Should have told Edmund that he can actually come back. <laughs> I wonder how they're getting on in the groups. You can have a peek if you want. Sorry? You can have a peek if you want. That's true, actually. That's true. I could have a peek. Um, I'm going to have a peek. Yeah, he likes to peek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I was looking for somebody, a group for somebody I know in. Which one's Nafisa in? Let's just go to this one. Okay, see you in a minute. Oh, Edmund's back. Edmund, how was how was that group going for you? There are people who are participating, and it's kind of interesting getting the ideas that they have about yeah. the strategy. Yes. I was just going to have a look at a, a few rooms quickly to see how people are getting on. Okay, okay. Let me do the same as well.
Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, when you were blindfolded, uh, we asked you to draw, right, your map, and uh, surely when your eyes are open, you could draw something like this, right, where you can see a clear line, where you can see clear circles and clear rectangles, all of those things representing something. However, when you are blindfolded, you end up getting something like this, gibberish at best, and it doesn't make sense when you look at it. And that was the intent of the exercise for us to show in a physical way that when you are coming up with uh, a publishing strategy, you are trying to create clarity in an area that is high uncertainty. There is a lot of uncertainty towards publishing trends. Uh, people were publishing 50 years ago, they didn't know about journal subscriptions. They didn't even know that there is something called double blind peer review, right? The chain trends change, right? When I started my journey as an uh, as an academic uh, in 2011, there was a big shift again towards responsible uh, evaluation of uh, of research, right? And with that big shift, there was now a change which is slowly taking uh, taking on of moving away from journal impact factor towards assessing research. Uh, based on its actual quality. And when that, uh, those ideas were being thrown in, then there was now a more emphasis on the number of publications and individual head. Uh, there is one famous uh, Nobel laureate who said, when he started his career as an academic, uh, right, this number of publications that he had at the time, the CV that he had when he was appointed a professor, and the CV that PhD holders now have, uh, his looks really like a sham that you couldn't get a job today with the CV that he had 50 years ago. So all those things uh, speak of the uncertainty that is there when it comes to publishing. So it's important to keep uh, the aspect of uncertainty in mind when you're developing your publishing strategy. So now uh, you want us to just take, take a moment. Let's relax, focus, look at the stars, then take five breaths together. Let's take five breaths together. When you, have, when you are there, just press the like button. Just press the like button when you are ready to take the breather. So are we ready? Five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five. Why are we doing this? 
you need to learn to reward yourself, especially when it, when it comes to publishing. You need to learn to reward yourself. We have finished activity one. Let's reward ourselves with that breathing. So we move on to the next. Now, this is going to be an exciting game. Uh, we are going to break out into, uh, into, into groups again. Now, the purpose of this game is for you to collect cards. I want you to listen carefully. You are going to collect cards of different colors. So in your groups, I want you to read the game, right? The instructions of the game, which is basically, this is a scenario of someone called Tariro, who's a PhD student and uh, planning about publishing so that they can have a, a different career. So there are three career options. They can focus in academia, they can go to industry or they can go to government, right? Those are the three choices that they have. But now we want to see if the, publishing strategy that, that this individual is using is going to help him get the job that they want, right? That's the instruction. You are going to be given different scenarios and then quickly you pick whether you are going to say yes or no. If you say yes, you are going to get a specific color card, which is either red, yellow, green, right? So you get all those cards, then at the end, we are going to talk about it. So in your groups, I want you to walk through, then you just discuss a little bit. You have to do it a little bit faster. Uh, this is going to be 30 minutes. Uh, as there, uh, the breakout room is 30 minutes. So we have uh, around 180 people. So groups of 12 will be fine. Please. When you are in your groups, count the number of cards that you are collecting. Can you move fast? Uh, because there are about 30 slides. So try to spend uh, at most one minute per slide. Spend at most one minute per slide. So we'll go to the breakout rooms. Thank you. Just click the link. Everyone, all of you have been assigned to uh, one of the breakout rooms. So uh, please click join in the pop-up that appears in your screen and let us know if you face any difficulties or need to be assigned manually. Someone in room one is asking for help.
Uh, yeah, I can't leave because I am recording. Ed no, no, mm -hmm. uh, Edmund. Yes. Someone in room one is asking for help. Room one. Okay, let me help. Is anyone facing difficulty joining the room? We have assigned everybody to one or another breakout room. So if it is possible, please join and participate in the discussions.
Hi, Edmond. Uh, how is it looking like in breakout rooms? Do you need any help? Uh, has the breakout room ended? No, this is new people joining. Yeah, so, yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, we are currently having a very interactive breakout room activity, and um, I think we'll manually assign you to breakout room, and you can participate in the discussions there. And for those of you who can't join, just let us know. We will do it manually from here, yeah? I'm going to just step into a couple of breakout rooms. I'll see to see how they how they're going.
I just joined um, a couple of the breakout rooms. Some people are doing it in groups and sharing the slides on the screen, and some people are doing it as individuals. So it's interesting to see different approaches to, to the game. Hi, Edmund. Have you been in many of the breakout rooms? Ah. <laughs>
Edmund. Edmund. Someone yeah. in room nine asked for help. Room nine. <laughs> Andy, could you check Slack, please? Yes. Ah. Uh, yeah. But I'm not sure if I share a message in chat, does that only get shared in the no, main group? Was, I mean, it was a few minutes ago when there were quite a lot of people in the main room. I think they were now assigned by us, to, but it's still worth putting it in just in case. Okay, okay. Edmund, <laughs> someone in room 16 <laughs> is asking for help. 16. Room 9, there is no one talking there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've okay. been there for twice now. All oh, right. So, um, Edmund, how are the groups looking? I've been in three now. One of them, they were doing it all individually. One and two of them, well, one of them, they're sharing it on screen and one they've already finished. And they got the yeah. job. I went to social <laughs> group number 23 or so, they're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, done, tick. Yeah. <laughs> so, most of them, they're doing individually. Mm. 
Yeah, so I think it might be a case of it's more of an individual exercise rather than discussing with the group. So yeah, we'll just discuss a little bit together then as we walk through. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. It's two minutes. Let me check the last one. Okay, so we we're engaged in this strategy game. Uh, if anyone can want two people just to give us some feedback on what they saw when they were engaging in this particular exercise, what what intrigued them, and what were the conflicts that they saw coming when we, when they were trying to make some decisions. Uh, you can raise your hand and uh, we'll get to you. So we have introduced to Tario, who's a PhD student at the local university. And like most early career research, Tario finds academic publishing challenging, complex, and full of uncertainties. So we are embarking in this journey with uh with Tariro. Then you are given different scenarios where you have to make a choice. And at the end of all this, you are going to call out the choices that you made. Then deal with that, they yes. in that area. Go ahead, Dr. Dijoke. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, you want me to make a comment? Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the slides, sir? Okay. 
Uh, if you have your microphone on, can you please turn it off? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Like I said, when you came to our breakout room, mm -hmm. I, I think writing a paper during the post, uh, PhD program should be an added advantage for a candidate to get into a postdoctoral position. At least the person is just fresh from PhD. And one of the criteria I, I, I'm, I'm sure is about uh, PhD candidates is for the candidate to have published his or her PhD paper. And in the course of training, so if the candidate has shown uh, potential of being a good writer by even contributing to a review, that one should account for opportunity in the academia. Mm -hmm. like getting a postdoc position so that one is just the little bit of error that was a little bit confused that with all the uh write up it did not account for the getting into a uh a postdoc okay so one of the things when you are so for it. us in our group our card number is like yet yellow and yeah. Well, there's no, there's no green. It, we only have two options: either the yellow card, yes, and the other one, no. So the other four options, I don't know where they are coming from. Thank you. Okay. So when you are writing, write uh, a review article. A review article demonstrates your ability to synthesize information. Really. Uh, but does it demonstrate your ability, your technical abilities? That's where research articles come in, right? We are going to talk more about that. Research articles are there to demonstrate your technical abilities. They show the skills that you have. Uh, do you have skills in data analysis? Do you have skills in uh, instrument-based work? Do you have skills in modeling? All those different aspects of uh, technical skills. That's where research articles come in. Whereas and reviews really they just demonstrate your ability to synthesize the information that is available to you. Does uh, is it valued now for a postdoctoral position? Which we know postdoctoral positions they are more of technical positions where you have to demonstrate your technical skills. So whenever that is the purpose of this strategy, really. So thank you for that comment. For us to see these small details that even the publication type is important when you are considering uh, your overall strategy, especially with this level of uncertainty that we have right now. So right now, uh, we are going to move on to uh, our next activity. I'm going to share the Mentimeter screen. Okay, so here's uh, one of uh, comments that I really like. If you have just joined, go to menti.com and use the code 15433267. menti.com, use code 15433267. Uh, here's a comment by uh, one of the professors from Amsterdam, uh, Ruben Cornea. He says, awareness of various publication types may help the young scientists to choose a publication strategy and to eventually obtain a position in which he or she is respected and able to publish even the most controversial ideas. I really loved this quote from this paper uh, published in Frontiers by uh, Ruben Cornell because it captures the uh, importance of publication type. You know, uh, there are some people who overemphasize publication numbers so when because of that illusion that it's the numbers that matter you'll find someone publishing 20 correspondences in even prestigious journals like nature science cell uh you name it they are publishing these correspondence with the hopes that they are increasing the number of publications but having 20 correspondences in lancet in cell in science and nature 
is it going to help you in your career? Or we are just going to say you are an academic letter writer. You are a celebrated academic letter writer because those letters are not going to be demonstrating your technical skills that are needed in academia. Yes, they will position you very, as someone who's good in science communication, but are you good now technically? And again, another trend, especially uh, in low resource countries, you focus, uh, you find people who publish 20 reviews per year, or even 10 reviews per year and zero original research articles. Now you step back and ask yourself, with these reviews, are they going to help me really demonstrate my technical skills? Because uh, you want, like, I, I, like what Cornell said, that you want something that is going to help you to gain the respect and to demonstrate your understanding of the topic. Uh, if you have a question, uh, you can drop it in the chat or raise, uh, then we can uh, talk about those questions uh, later. Now, uh, there's something that uh, uh, in the same article says that there are four different types of uh, publishing strategies. There is the confirmatory, or which you called consumerist uh, publishing strategy. With confirmatory publishing strategy, is this is where you, you are conducting more of an incremental type of research. For example, I'm in environmental sciences. Uh, we know that there is pollution taking place. So I can conduct some incremental research where I look at environmental pollution in rivers from Zimbabwe or Southern Africa, right? There is a lot of work that has already been done on water pollution, right? But there is limited studies that have been conducted on water pollution in Zimbabwe, right? So now I do the study. So that type of study is more of consumerist I'm just going to be using the same technologies that have been developed by others, the same research designs developed by others, and I'm just going to be adding new insights to understand the extent of pollution in Zimbabwe, right? So that is more of a confirmatory uh, or consumerist study. Then there is what's uh, called consensual uh, studies. I've taken part in, throughout my career, I've taken part in three uh, cons consensual studies. Uh, the first one, I was invited by a professor from George Mason University, where we looked at legislative science. So in total, we are around 70 authors from across the world, right? Uh, all of us talking about legislative science advice in our different countries, in our different contexts, right? So it became a consensus amongst us right, that this is the state of, of, uh, of um, legislative science advice in the world. So it's more of a consensus paper. So it took, I think, two and a half years to write that paper, right, from, from conception up to the final paper that we published. So that's an example of a consensus uh, paper. The most popular consensus uh, work is the global burden of disease. Maybe you've seen those publications, GBD. Uh, it's really popular where you can have more than 200 different authors per contributing. Uh, the largest consensus paper that I have part participated in is uh, Scientist's Warning uh, to Climate Change. Uh, in total, we were 11,000 uh, researchers who have contributed to that paper. So it's a consensus paper, different authors coming together to share ideas, and uh, it takes very long for those type of paper. Then the next one is competitive. Uh, you maybe have heard that age that uh, if you are slow to publish, you'll be outbeaten by others. Someone is already working on the area you are working on. Like that good idea that you have, someone already came up with it. So it's now a battle, a race to who is going to publish first. That's competitive publishing. Uh, it's really common in some countries where there is high stock towards being the first to report on something, right? So it's more of competition. So it's probably breaking new grounds and everything. But the most uh, uh, breakthrough type of studies is controversial, where you are coming up with ideas that rarely have been uh, spoken about, that very few people are talking about. Now, one thing that you will notice with controversial ideas, there is one former uh, novel laureate who said, 
that the thing about controversial ideas is you wait for all your detractors to die first before you publish it because it's going to take long for it to pass through peer review because it's a controversial study. The ideas that you are putting forth are kind of controversial. So you experience that. I have one publication like that. It is still under peer review. I submitted it in July 2022. Uh, today it's going to its fifth round of peer review. And you witness those things. Another famous one is uh, when you are the RNA, the RNA virus uh, for, for, for vaccines. Uh, you remember that uh, the lady was actually denied tenure, lost funding, all those things because of the controversial ideas that they had regarding vaccines. So that is uh, one thing that you'll notice with controversial ideas. They are slow and sometimes you'll pay with your career. So those are the different publishing strategies that you have. Now, let's have some fun a little bit. I, can you rank uh, these following strategies in regard to alignment to your career goals? Whatever your career goal is, which one do, would you rank first, second, third, or fourth amongst these ones? Uh, if you are in industry, which one would you rank first? If you are in government, if you aim for academia, which one would you rank? So let's go ahead and do that exercise. If you have arrived there, just place a like or a love so that we know that we are all in it together. You are just dragging and dropping. Okay, it seems like consumerist is the popular one, followed by competitive, then third, consensual, and fourth, controversial. Uh, yes, I would expect consumerist to be the top one uh, because it is a quicker turnaround, right? You are not have to struggle with uh, designing the research. You are not going to struggle with the analyzing analysis part. You are not going to struggle with even the peer review, because if it's consumerist, that means there are many people who have done what you are doing. So you are going. It's easy to get peer reviewers. If competitive, uh, this is really good. If you want, to, if you are want to focus more on uh, getting funding, really, uh, you need competitive. Uh, a competitive publishing strategy. Then consensual, uh, we would expect this really for those who are now at an advanced age in their career, really those who are more established researchers, they'll go for the consensual. Then I'm kind of surprised that controversial is number four, really. Uh, I would expect controversial to be number one because you know when you walk into science, you want to break new grounds. Right, you want to do something daring, something that is going to change how we look at things. Uh, I had the, the privilege, really, of having my second publication to be a controversial uh, research article. My first publication, unfortunately, was in a predatory journal. It was a consumerist study. Um, it was more of a competitive study, really, when I was I was one. Of, I was actually the first person to find uh, a certain carcinogen in foods that are prepared traditionally in Africa. And unfortunately, my competitive study, I dumped it in a predatory journal. And the next study that I did was now controversial because I was coming up with a new model of understanding a particular problem. And it took time uh, in, in, in peer review, but it was finally accepted. Consumerist, most of my publications are really consumerist, uh, where I'm just moving forward. It's more incremental with what people have done. Uh, yeah, so you can see it's really important that you take a step back, really think deeply about the strategy that you're going to use. Are you really want to just add numbers, consumerist, 
are you want to be the first or are you want to be just someone who agrees network with other people or you just want to make new make new roads pave new grounds make breakthroughs do some moonshot pro uh, projects that are going to make your name stand out so you need to really think about all those things Okay, so we have finished the first, ex the second exercise in our groups where we had played the strategy game. The idea was for us to uh, kind of have this simulation of uh, what is really important when you are deciding which strategy you are going to use uh, as a researcher. So you just, I want us just to take five breaths, breaths again. Now, in, as you are breathing in, I want you to think again uh, about the decisions that you made uh, regarding Tariro, right? When you were saying, okay, I want Tariro to write a review, I want Tariro to write a conference paper, I want Tariro to write a popular article. Which publishing strategy were you using? Let's just take a, take a five breaths and just think about the strategy that was informing you when you were making those decisions. Okay, so we move on. Now, now we want to come up with strategies, with uh, effective strategies. We are going to use two. The first one is called the balance scorecard developed by a Harvard professor. And the second one is the PESTLE, P-E-S-T-L-E. -E. Maybe you've heard about that. So I developed uh, this method uh, using borrowing from the Harvard, but also look, looking at the researcher uh, development uh, framework, uh, which was developed by Vite. So that's how I developed this uh, balanced scorecard. So uh, it looks like this. With the balanced scorecard, right, what you need to understand is uh, we need first to have a strategy map, right? Remember when I asked you at the beginning that activity for you to develop a map, right? You expected to draw something like this, right? However, you ended up drawing something like this, right? This is what you were expecting, but this is what you draw when you were blindfolded, right? Uh, now, we want to take the blinders off so that you come up with something like this. That's the strategy map. So how do we do it? Uh, it's important that you understand that your map should be based on five perspectives, right? You need to understand the perspective of the career. That is more of an intrinsic perspective that is within you. What is the career that you want, right? Uh, how does your strategy fit in with that career? What are your career objectives, really? Next, you look at the funder perspective or employer perspective, because it's the funder and the employer that are going to make it possible for you to use the skills that you have demonstrated in your publication, in your publication output. It's the funder and the employer that are going to recognize value and reward that publication output. So you now need to look at your publication objectives using that perspective of the funder. Then the next thing, the research process, what you'll be doing, look at the process. What are the technical skills and the knowledge that you are going to gain from conducting that research that is going to produce uh, the publications, right? Then the other perspective is the research impact. Step back, consider your parents, consider your friends, consider uh, uh, the, your country's economy, consider people from uh, different areas, raw areas, urban areas, What's their perspective regarding your research, right? Because you want to create a strategy that is of high impact. So what is the strategy? What is the perspective do they have? So how do you create an objective that aligns with that kind of research impact need? Then the next thing is we all want to be research leaders. 
we want to be leaders in the area that we are, we, we are conducting research. So using the perspective of a leader, you have moved away from the impact, societal impact, now to your leadership, right? What, consider that perspective. Will you be training um, master's students? Will you be training undergraduate students? Will be, you be training postdoctoral students? Will you be collaborating with other people? Will you be uh, uh, kind of creating your brand as a research leader so that we can say, oh, Edmond is known for chiral pollutants. Edmond is known for marine uh, mammalian toxicology, right? That is, you are creating your brain. So you need that strategy. So when you have your strategy map, the next thing is you now need to balance your scorecard. That is, you look at the measures and the targets. How are you going to measure the career perspective? Are you going to measure the employer perspective, the process, the impact, and the leadership? Then you set your targets. So this is kind of a strategy um, that is called the balanced scorecard strategy framework that you can use. You can just take this and write it down. So this is what we want to do now in the next uh, 15 minutes. We want to develop preliminary ideas of this strategy map. So now I'm going to give you uh, one minute, one minute. Uh, to write an objective that ensures your target employer or funder perceive your publication output in the desired way. Write an objective that ensures your target employer or funder perceive your publication output in the desired way. One minute. Okay. First one is to publish in high impact journals. Anyone? Okay, so with get a PhD, that probably means that you uh, have a PhD thesis, that's your goal. Okay, so we I noticed most people are focusing on impact factor, uh, most focusing on impact factor, then another person is say to develop cost effective interventions through research that is more societal. Now, the question is, when you are looking at impact factor, right, uh, do funders and employers value impact factor of a journal that you're publishing in? Is it something that is of importance? Really, uh, right these days we have what is called San Francisco, San Francisco Dora. I would suggest that we look at it. Uh, we also have what's called uh, Quara, which is coalition of uh, uh, research assessment. All these efforts are trying to move away of focus on impact factor. That impact factor is a mark of the journal, not of the article. It's saying publications in this journal are on average going to get 10 citations in two years. 
it, it doesn't talk about the specific journal article. So when you put your strategy, your objective is publishing high impact vector journal, it could be a target, but is it an objective, really? So I, I like this one. Someone said my publication will proffer solutions to the desired global defeat I am making research on. This is specific that they want to conduct research that is proffering solutions. Uh, another one saying to evaluate the impact of educational sessions on EMA. Now, what happens when your interest shifts from EMA, right, in public health? Maybe you are now interested in something different uh, about EMA. Can that objective stand the test of five years? Then someone says, make sure it solves the problem that was stated by the funder, right? So if that funder, uh, stops funding, really, uh, like what happened with the funds. Uh, you remember uh, with Africa Academy of Sciences, it stopped funding research. It had its uh, research priorities. Now what? Are you going to stop research because the funder has changed their goals? So why am I asking all these questions? It's because we need to think about how the employer and the funder perceive publication output, what matters to them. Now, next one, how will you measure the career prospective objective? Let's look at career prospective objective. How will you measure it? Are you going to use the number of publications? Can you rank for career? Can we rank that if you are there? Okay. Uh, most people are saying publication type, lead authorship, journal impact factor is climbing, number of publications is climbing, career lead authorship. How will you measure the career perspective? What do you think is going to be a priority? Okay, so most people agree that lead authorship uh, is kind of uh, one of what is prioritized most of the time, followed by type of publication. Right. Uh, with lead authorship, when you are the corresponding author or first author, uh, that publication is given more value. And I, I know particularly in uh, East Asia, mainly that's really important, really in South Asia, it's, this aspect is really important that we lead, when you're a lead author, then type of publication, this is what is cropping up these days. The type of publication really can affect, uh, can influence the perspective, right? So when you are crafting your objective, you need to think about those things like lead authorship, type of publication, and general impact factor, right? General impact factor, again, like I mentioned, is still a priority in some countries, but uh, in most countries, it's, it's no longer that important. What is really advised is avoid publishing in predatory journals. Avoid publishing in low quality journals, right? Try to publish in uh, high impact, in, in sorry, in uh, repeatable journals no, and avoid those uh, low quality journals. Then what's fascinating uh, here is fewer people are, most people ranked frequency of publication uh, at a low level. This is kind of interesting because I had a conversation with one senior who said that you need to maintain your momentum, right? If you're publishing two papers per year, just keep it at that, right? Uh, when you publish eight papers in one year, then go back to two, it appears like uh, you're, you, you, you are failing in your, in your planning, really, that you need to maintain your frequency at a particular rate so that you can demonstrate that you are really growing and at the same time, you are not falling back. So those are some of the things that you need to consider when you are looking at your publishing strategy. Then now let's look at uh, writing an objective so that it, it should demonstrate your desired levels of or for career value creation. 
right? The first one, we're looking at the perspective of the employer. Now, what about your perspective regarding your career? What uh, objective would you write? So I'll give you uh, one minute for that. Okay, public policy improvement, uh, grant acquisition, their focus is mainly to get a grant, uh, avoiding low quality uh, journals, predator journals. Uh, again, uh, high visibility, a good structured strategy. That's the question here. What is that strategy would you, you will write, right? What is the strategy that you, uh, publishing in, in areas that are emerging, uh, then target specific uh, impact factor. So what's the objective that you are going to use? Then acquire grants, uh, that's the target again, and publishing of, right. So all this is going to help us. I just wanted to post my uh, equitable access. That's again, research area. So what is your strategy? Your research process, we are saying, your writing plan and your processes. How do they demonstrate the value that you're creating, right? I can talk about writing, uh, forming a network of researchers so that we can share ideas, innovative ideas together and collaborate. That's a strategy because when an employer looks at me, they see my social capital, that I have collaborations in Brazil, I have collaborations in Zimbabwe, South Africa, in, in India, Pakistan, in China. That is my social capital that I'm bringing to that employer. So as my career objective is to grow my social capital through my publication, through the, my publication, so I network more. So that is the why what you need to look at when you are preparing your objective, right? Then how will you measure? Now let's go back to employer funder perspective. How are you going to measure that? Let's look at the employer funder. For the funding organization, how will they, my slides seems like they've mixed up here. How will you measure uh, the employer funder perspective? Can you just rank them? Lead authorship, number of publications, journal impact factor. Okay, lead authorship is high. Uh, type of publication is high as well. Journal impact factor seems like it's really popular. So it's really, it's kind of intriguing really from our, like if you notice we are coming from different parts of the world everywhere, right? You will notice really in some parts of the world, journal impact factor is still valued high, but it's something that, uh, uh, we are working against really uh, and part of Quara and we are working towards moving away from journal impact factor. So now, just really like what I mentioned here, there are organizations working towards moving away journal impact factor, right? Now, you happen to be starting, you are doing your master's right now and you start focusing on journal impact factor. Something probably by the time you are in the job market, it's no longer, general impact factor is no longer that important. So <clears throat> whenever you are coming up with the, the measures, right, of your objective, of measures of success for your objective, right, or key performance indicators, think about that. You need to understand the trends in publishing, really, so that you can come up with measures that are going to be relevant in five or in 10 years' time.
Now, I want you to Okay, I want you to use the word cloud just to think about the research process. Research process, you are saying, if you are a laboratory-based person, when you walk into the lab, what is the most important thing that you're going to look at? Or someone says impact. What can you use? How do you measure impact, really? That's the question that we are asking. Scientific rigor, yes. Uh, with scientific rigor, we can look at things like validity, right? We can look at repeatability, right? We can look at novelty. All those things are talking about scientific rigor, right? What else? How would you measure innovation, contribution to NERS, smart objectives for your research, the solutions that you are going to proctor? Uh, solutions, solutions, and someone says citations. Another one mentions policy brief. Policy briefs, uh, it's more, it's now away from the research process, right? It's now more on research impact. Really, uh, what else? Reproducibility, result validity, quality, research quality, accuracy, that's again under uh, the validity, uh, critical thought, the outcomes, all these things, right, are speaking on uh, the importance of measuring your research process the process that you're going to look at. I'm surprised that no one mentioned technical skills, right? Uh, if you are into climate science, right, you might talk of uh, proficiency using different uh, coding uh, tools, right? Or it could be modeling, or it could be things like R, data processing tools, right? Those technical skills, you need to include them. You might talk about uh, proficiency, uh, maybe, in using specific type of equipment. I'm from chemistry, so I'll talk of uh, proficiency using chromatography or spectroscopy. That's specific to me, right? Those are my objective, right, for the research process. I want to demonstrate that I understand this process, right? This research process. So that's really important when you are coming up with your uh, research objectives. Okay, then I want us to look at the value to society. What can you use to measure your research impact objectives, right? The value that you're going to give to society. Yes, policy making. I'm writing mine as well. Yes, news interviews, newspaper interviews. When you appear, appear on those uh, policy briefs again, uh, policy making change, um, kind of curious what and change and transformation, what that really means. Uh, impact studies, those are specific, I think, in health, they have to do impact studies. Uh, research uptake, uh, maybe by society or by industry, all those things are speaking about. Uh, then relevance to audience, maybe you mean uh, to society, right? Uh, accept acceptability, that's again, that might be linked to society accepting your research findings and making use of those results, right? Cost effectiveness, maybe develop some tools and they are now being used uh, as an in cost effective intervention, right? Uh, diagnosis and therapies and translation, that is more aligned to uh, to those who are in health. Uh, someone said citations. Uh, when you're looking at your research impact, uh, citations doesn't really demonstrate impact. Uh, it's just talking about the conversations that are there about your paper by other people uh, who are studying similar work to yours. So it's more of a um, uh, singing to the choir, really. Uh, but when we're talking of research impact, we're talking of the uptake of your research outside of your research tower. Right, so things like policy reviews really talks uh, more of that research impact. So that's the, so it's really important for us to start thinking about the impact of our research when you are drafting your 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 your, your strategy map and then come up with uh, with the balance scorecard. Some of the measures that we can use are the ones listed here.
So next, we want to look at leadership. Uh, how can you demonstrate leadership? How can you measure leadership? Let me write my thoughts as well. Okay, grant success. Yeah, that if you are getting a grant as a team, really, and you are the PI on that, that demonstrates uh, leadership. Uh, then panel speakership, when you are invited as a plenary speaker, really, that kind of speaks of your leadership. Editorial board appointment, last authorship. Um, not, notice some people mentioned first author. Again, that depends with the field. Uh, in some fields, first author is normally the one that walked into the lab or who did the actual experiments. And the last author is the one who funded the research, which means they are the leader of the group. So it depends with the country that you're coming from. Uh, reliability, uh, all those things, then sometimes keynote speaker invitations, uh, they are all talking about research leadership. So what I really like about the comments that you have written that most people are emphasizing on the soft skills, things like communication, good writing, availability, uh, being a role model, being tolerant, your profile is a, your professionalism, your societal impact, your how you mentor your 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 your, your peers, sustainability, all those they are kind of. Uh, soft skills really that we need to see in a leader, right? Which is really good. So now we will now need to take a step back and ask yourself, how can I write an objective really that captures all these things, both the hard skills and the soft skills so that you can be a whole leader who can work well with others beyond firm and number of citations. Right. So thank you for all those comments. Uh, the last one, I'm just going to rush through it. Uh, this is a person uh, where you just look at the political environment where you are at right now and look at how, how do you develop your strategy to address the political context that you are coming from. Then as well as the economic context, right? Uh, for example, when you are coming from a country where there is no funding for research, really. So you can't buy the fancy new equipment. So how do you design your research in a way that your publication started so that you can use the resources that are available? Do you now have to network, grow your network, collaborate more with other people who have those resources so that you can continue with your career, with your career despite the economic challenges that your country is facing. So that needs to be part of your strategy, really. You need to look at the economy of the country that you're in so that you can develop something that works. Then uh, the next thing is the environmental impact, really. Uh, when you're designing your research, do you think about the environment, really, where you are going to conduct your research? How do you view that environment? How do you view the people who are actually living in those contexts so that you have a strategy that you're going to use? It's not going to be detrimental to the environment. It's not going to cause degradation to the environment. It's going to continue to respect the environment that you are working on. But environment doesn't take, talk, talk only about the outside environment. Um, and can also talk about the environment where you are conducting your research, the infrastructure that is available to you, uh, the support network that you have around you, that, the, that research environment in your local context. So when you're coming up with your strategy, you need to, to look at that. Then the next thing you look at the technology. What are the techni technological tools that you can use to help you achieve your publishing strategy, right? For these days, there is a lot of talk about generative AI, chat GPT, Google Gemini, uh, cloud, all those tools. If you go to author aid website, we actually have a toolkit for different uh, AI tools that you get, different tools that you can use to help you in your writing process. 
So how do you develop a publishing strategy that uses the technology that is available to you? Then we can also talk about the legal aspects. Uh, legal aspects are things like the ethics of the research that you are going to do. If you're going to work with humans in environment, you need to look at the ethical aspects as well. So it's really important to use this pencil tool. Uh, it can be uh, useful to you. So now we'll just jump into some questions. Uh, you can drop the questions from in the uh, mentee or in the chat. Uh, if you drop on mentee, I'll read them. If you drop on chatty, someone will help me with your comments. Then also, if you, have, uh, you can raise your hand as well. So right now, you're free to ask any questions that you have. Okay, uh, someone asked what do you mean by journal impact? So journal impact factor, um, uh, this is a metric that just looks at the number of articles that have been published by a journal in two years, right? Let's say it has published 10, 10 articles in two years, right? Then the number of citations those articles received, right? So, we have 10 publications, number of citations received, let's say it's 100. So we'll now divide 100 number of citations divided by number of articles published, which is 10. So the general impact factor of that journal now A becomes 10. Now, people will say, oh, 10, that's a high impact factor journal. But here's the thing, out of those 10, maybe it's only two articles that actually contributed the 100. One at 49 and another one at 51, right? So it's two articles that did 100 citations, not the rest eight, right? So when you are saying, oh, I published in a high impact filter journal so that my, my article is a high impact article. No, uh, the articles that were published previously, some of them were high, it were cited highly. So that's a uh, journal impact factor. Uh, any question? As a beginner in research, how do I begin? Good question. Uh, if you did the strategy game that we did at the beginning, uh, that it shows you that you need to come up with a clear strategy. First, decide what type of researcher are you based on your early career research, on your stage, right? And you ask yourself, what is the career that I desire? If it is academia, if it is government, if it is industry, then what is the publishing strategy that is valued in that space? That is where you are supposed to begin. So using those, uh, the pencil it was going to help you to understand the context of your publishing strategy. Using balanced scorecard is going to help you to create the strategy map that you need. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, when you were talking about uh, career value creation at a level objective, we mentioned social capital as a strategy. I'm asking, is social capital the only strategy, strategy in career value creation? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's one of the out of many, really. You can look, I mentioned you need technical skills. Right, technical skills, those are the hard skills that you're going to demonstrate when you walk into uh, a lab, if you were doing lab work, a field, if you do field work, right? Uh, or when you are doing your modeling. So you need technical skills, right? Then social capital is now the perspective of the employer. They are looking at you as an individual. Yes, you have got the skills, but what else can you bring, right? Then you're saying, oh, I'm bringing a network of researchers from around the globe who are going to help me help you, right? So that's more of the social capital aspect. And in some cases, it's not emphasized. If you go in some countries, they don't really care about your collaborations. So again, using that PESTLE, right? P-E-S-T-L-E, it's going to help you to understand your context, right? Know your context before you embark on your strategy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
how can someone identify a willing and good mentor? How can a young scientist present himself for a good mentor in research? Uh, that's a good question, but today we're just focusing on your strategy, your publishing strategy. I know a mentor can help influence your publishing strategy, really. If you have a good mentor, they can help you, inform you on your publishing strategy, right? Uh, I had uh, one mentor, really, when I, was, when I started my PhD advisor, I was invited to publish a book chapter, and he told me that, Edmund, in your chosen area of research, environmental chemistry and toxicology, book chapters are not valued. So you can spend uh, three months writing that book chapter, but remember, at the end of the day, no one is going to look at it because of the field that you are in. So all those things, they can help you. You can look at the publishing history of that publication output of that individual, their frequency. It can kind of give you an idea of what they value. I hope maybe we'll have a separate master class or maybe we'll write a, 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 an article and publish it on author aid to answer this specific question. I hope Andy can note that question. Is the recording and the presentation? Yes, it's going to be shared. It's available on YouTube. Why does it take so long to publish in Scopus Index? Uh, all those high impact vector journals. Again, this is going to speak on uh, publication frequency as part of your strategy. If you are going to choose uh, journals that are repeatable, accessible, and visible, then it comes at a cost. Uh, I didn't mention a lot about costs when you're coming up with strategy, but thank you for the question because there is a cost to it, right? In some cases, it's funding cost that you need to pay to, to publish uh, in open access. In some cases, it means time cost, right? If a journal is highly repeatable, that means they receive, I'm an editor for one journal. Uh, in one week, I can receive 15 uh, research articles to review and recommend for peer review. As an editor, I receive your article, there are 15 more, and I have to do that in, in, in 30 minutes of my time to read your article, then send it for peer review, right? Then I then send to peer review that research article and reviewers can not respond. So if they don't respond, I will know that after three weeks that the reviewer has not responded, then I will send reminders then they won't respond. Then I'll look for a different reviewer. It's still you as a researcher paying for that process that a reviewer is not responding or a reviewer declines after three weeks. You wait, I'm waiting for their response. After three weeks, they say decline. Now I have to look for another reviewer, right? So it's that cost that we are going to make. So when you're coming up with your strategy, you need to think about the cost of publishing, either cost in terms of monetary ways or in cost, cost in terms of time and cost in terms of the emotions again when you receive that rejection from the journal that you want to uh, do this uh, publication study. Apply to all right? kinds of... Yes. Uh, yes, please. Thank you so much for the interesting presentation. I want to know if you're, from your personal point of view, what do you think the frequency for a lecture at an university? I know it depends on the the frequency of publication, I mean, I know it depends on the availability, but from your point of view, personal point of view, what do you think the minimum number of publication for a lecturer at a university? Uh, it's, it's going to depend on the number of factors, really, and it's going to vary from country to country, and in some cases from contract to contract. Uh, when I was in one country, my contract specifically mentioned when I was a postdoc that I need to publish two articles per year. That was based on my contract. When I was now an associate professor, it says eight articles per year in high impact vector journals, in Q1 journals, right? That was specific to the contract. Then where I am right now, there is no minimum really, that it's more of you just going, uh, be consistent really. Uh, so you need to understand, like I said, your context. So as a lecturer, I can't give you a number because it's your context and your goal that is going to determine that. Thank you so Professor, much. I yes, have a question, please. Professor Edmond. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. This was really a wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Many tips and uh, you were able to clarify a lot of questions that I had. That's why I would just like go out, like uh, uh, back down the hands because you clarify a lot of, of, of questions. But I would like to ask you if um, moving for to, to um, developed country, mm -hmm. like aiming to move to develop, join a research center developed country, is it a strategy? For, 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 you know, productivity, impact. And second question, um, you know, sometime at the beginning, example for me, I suffer a lot. I want to learn a lot of things and I end up uh, spending a lot of time, want to understand the different kind of statistics, how to write, and uh, I want to evolve in different fields. But at the end, uh, I start to feel like, wow, I'm just spending a lot of time, you know, the paper they're not coming and you were talking about this uh idea okay, okay it's better to publish a lot but if you have your opportunity to publish using different kind of of method is good but the time consuming to have this uh, to to gain knowledge and different type of, uh, of strategy i would like to hear comments around these two points i mentioned thank you so much professor Oh, thank you, Nelson. Thank you for the comments and thank you for the questions. And I, I really love the first question because it's something I never considered. And when he said it, I said, oh, yeah, that's really important. Uh, because when, when you are designing your research, your, 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 your strategy, say, I just want to be focusing on the countries. How do I do that? It's really important and it can be a strategy. I had uh, one friend, uh, he moved from a high resource country to a low resource country. That was his strategy because his reasoning was that's the only way that I can do research that I love and that I value and that they have impact. Because you notice that if I remain in a high resource country, my research is supported by someone else. So Yes, it can be a very valuable strategy. And uh, if you go to TWAS website, they have grants that are available for those people who want to make that kind of decision to move in a, a high, country, high, in a high uh, resource to a low resource country. They are grants specific for that. And that's a good strategy. Royal Society, again, has grants for that. Welcome Trust has grants for that. Uh, so they are. That's a good strategy that someone can adopt. Really. Then coming to the next question, that yes, it's time consuming. Coming up with all these things is time consuming. Uh, because sometimes when you are, I, I I decided one morning that I want to do more of environmental policy. So you can't just go and do environmental policy. You have to learn more. So I spent more like really months studying other papers, look at how they do their analysis. I learned how to write policy briefs because it's something that I'm interested in. So I invested time in doing that, but it can be time consuming and it can affect your other areas of productivity. So that balanced scorecard, let's go back to the balanced scorecard, will help you in making those decisions. When you have created your balanced scorecard, all of it, it's going to help you to say no to some opportunities. It's going to help you to, to know when you can say yes and when you can say no. Because as researchers, most of our time is wasted on things that contribute little to our career growth. Uh, you remember there is a diagram called the Pareto, uh, Pareto chart, if you know the 90-10 rule, right? That 90% things that contribute 90% of impact uh, normally come from the 10% and the 90% is really kind of wasted energy. So that is the same scenario with us in, in, in research that you need to understand which one are the 90 wasted, en wasted energies. So you try to eliminate those and focus on those that give you high impact. So it could be a valuable strategy. I hope that works. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, thank you, Nelson. Uh, another question from uh, online is, do these publications apply um, to all kinds of publications? 
uh, for example, systematic reviews. Uh, please note with publishing strategy, right? It's not for journal articles only. It's your academic publishing, right? It encompasses uh, popular articles. It encompasses uh, pro grant proposals, all those data sets, everything that you are going to be creating by writing, you, in you include it in your strategy, right? Like I said, it's going to help you to eliminate unnecessary activities that waste your time. What advice do you have for someone for, to overcome the fear of process involved in publication? Uh, my advice is, is write. Wake up one morning, just write it, format it, and submit it. Forget about everything else, right? Uh, because rejections, we are all going to get rejections. So don't let the fear of rejection stop you from developing a high impact publishing strategy because rejections, we are all going to get them really. So do not make re rejections stop you from developing your strategy. Is there material you could prepare for us on this topic? Yes, I'm sure uh, and is going to provide you. There are videos that I've created that uh, you are going to access. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is Asta. I think we have run uh, 15 minutes over time. Yes. Um, I'm so sorry, but I think I have to interrupt. Maybe you can text take one last question and then we can take a picture and end this. Okay, thank you. Uh, any last question? I'm so okay. sorry about this, but- it's, it's fine, thank you. Thank you for reminding. So yes, so the aim of this workshop, uh, we wanted to understand how publication needs evolve from career stage um, across fields and from different employers. Then the next thing, what motivates CEO to publish? Then we also looked at uh, your publishing journey, really uh, what, how does it link with your future aspirations? Then how to design an effective publishing strategy. We looked at balance scorecard. Uh, we looked at the PESTLE, and I also mentioned the Pareto uh, analysis. So all these strategies can help you to publish high impact work effectively. So if you have questions, uh, you get my, uh, my email. I'll post it, you can, or you can ask us there. Uh, it will help you to get any resources that we have. So over to you, Esther. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for such a lovely engagement. And so sorry that I had to interrupt. We, it was so interesting that it is already uh, 18 minutes over time and all of you are here. Uh, thank you so much, Edmund, for yet another brilliant session. As somebody who is just starting off, I learned a lot myself, and I believe that every one of us here did. Um, we'd love to see you in upcoming courses also. Tabitha has shared that our, um, you can see in the chat box, she has, she has shared our uh, getting started with writing and publishing your research uh, is a very um, famous and very much loved a uh, massive open online course and it is happening in April. The enrollment will be opened in March and for the month of uh, March, we also have uh, this opening and two other tea times that are already planned. One is happening in the French language. And for those of you who are uh, excited about speaking in French and having a cup of tea, talking about academia, join us. And there is another one happening uh, that is an English language, but a very informative one. We'll, um, I, we will start the social media marketing pretty soon. And for those, you have to uh, just give me a minute. Uh, let me share with you our, uh, yeah. So uh, I have shared a few links in, this, uh, in the chat box. You can see, uh, a few very useful link. You can join our community of more than 15,000 scholars. Um, I'm going to, mute. yeah. Uh, so there is the link, please join us uh, there. Uh, it is very interactive group. A lot of discussions are always happening there and I believe that it will be useful to many of us. For the Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram where we are very active, especially in Twitter and 
I think everywhere. So just stay connected with us there also. Uh, and if you think you can contribute the resources that might be useful to other early career researchers and researchers around the globe, uh, please contribute those. There is a link uh, in the chat box. And we'd really love to hear your opinions, experiences, um, and would love for you to share your knowledge and particular topic. So contribute the blog and articles in the news section. You can see the link there. And so you have any confusion, you can email us. Uh, I will also, uh, regarding all these things, if you have any confusion, you can email me at this email address. And with this, let's take a picture. Yeah. And if you have any questions right now, you can ask too. Yeah, we, um, if it is possible, please start on a video. Okay, um, I think I'm going to take a picture now. So everyone, wave. Wave. yes, <laughs> you can wave. Um, yeah, that's that's a lovely sight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I will take off the another screen because we are many people here. <laughs> yeah. There's some people still still turning their cameras on as well. Okay, we'll take one again. So if you have any uh, other poses, funny poses, or you just want to wave, please do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Edmund, for being here and for a very good facilitation. I hope all of you had a very good learning journey. Uh, we'll also share um, the recording in your email um, and post these pictures in our social media. So please follow us there. Also, thanks to the author team for being here and for successful execution of the program. Bye-bye, everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank um, you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Um.